We all forget things. Most of us know we need to practice to prevent that, and some of us seem to forget things quicker than others. I know lots of people that say they have bad memories, but there are some memories that just stick in your mind, even if you don't want them to sometimes. The forgetting curve tries to fill in part of this story, which is from a study between 1880 and 1885. This replication study is more recent and in English, not German, so I can read it, which managed to replicate the results but wasn't without differences and some considerations. It mentioned other studies have failed to replicate the famous curve, but this could be due to the poor documentation of the original study from 1932. Ebbinghaus, the person that did the original study, did it alone. The obvious limitation is that not everyone is the same, and the results can't necessarily be used universally, which is what seems to happen with the curve's use today. The basic idea was learn a row of 13 nonsense syllables and recall them correctly in order twice. The authors of this paper mentioned they use methods from a previous replication study by Heller and colleagues, which is also in German, so I can't read that either. But like that replication, the savings measure was used for learning and memory, which is the relative amount of time saved on the second learning trial. Learning something quicker the second time is better. If the first time took 25 attempts and the second time took 20 attempts, that is a 5 attempt difference, and 5 divided by 25 is 0.2 or 20%. If you remember it all, then the number attempt difference would be the total attempts, meaning 25 divided by 25, which is 1 or 100% remembered. They mention this measure has been found to not be a reliable measure for memory, and it is done differently now, but that is how they measured it for this replication study. Because of time constraints, they only performed 10 replications rather than the full 45, so the variance is larger in this study. In addition to that, instead of using the same time to study every day, they adjusted the scores accordingly. If you want to know more about that, it talks about it in the paper. The time intervals were the same though, 20 minutes, 1 hour, 9 hours, 1 day, 2 days, 6 days, and 31 days. I found it mildly amusing, they used Microsoft Word for tracking the repetitions, putting a, a 1 on the keyboard at the beginning of every single repetition of a row. But during the learning phase, they could pick to either read or reproduce the syllables, which for those familiar with the educational science literature, retrieval practice is a very powerful technique, and so I imagine that may play a role in the effectiveness of the learning. How that impacts the results, I'm not sure, but it is worth considering. Individuals did get a break of 15 seconds before going to the next row. They had to get the row correct before moving on. Again, I think this will impact their learning potential. In what direction, I'm not sure, but the rests are something to consider. An important point to note before we look at the table and graph is that on the day 31, there was a difference in the learning section which decreased the time period for the initial learning resulting in what they called massed learning, essentially not good results. So here we have the table of results, the original Ebbinghaus study with two other replications and Dross being the participant in this particular replication. The numbers you are seeing are the saving measure, so the shorter break of 20 minutes had better memory or learning results, and the longer break taking more tries, presumably due to the forgetting over time, which produces the forgetting curve. The graph starts to show some of the interesting findings in this forgetting curve that doesn't look like a curve. Each person seems to have a bump in performance around the one day mark. Another point to make here before discussing the results too much is that the savings measures are recalling previous trials. So each trial is part of the learning, which is different from normal memory retention experiments. This means that results for memory retention and learning may look slightly different. Each replication study found a trend of learning the first two and last three syllables first, which was put to the primacy and recency effect, learning first and last things earlier. So the hardest part was learning the middle sections, which is benefited by multiple learning sessions. On the second trial, the first two syllables that weren't remembered would be the new primacy effect and the last three the recency effect. This could lead to quicker learning, impacting the forgetting results. Without diving too heavily into memory models and information processing, the so-called memory chain model assumes memories pass through several neural processes or stores, from short term to long term. The proposed idea is that store one, or short term memory, has a different decay rate than store two, or long term memory. 
This suggests getting things out of short-term memory quicker is beneficial for retention. However, those familiar with memory research may wonder where working memory and its components fit into that. Which is a different conversation, but does beg the question, how is the decay time assigned, allocated, or put onto a memory? Also raising questions about chunking and schema and all that fun stuff. But what is also brought up is the effect sleep has on memory. Recent research has found that sleep helps with learning and memory, which is argued to explain the 24-hour bump in the curve when adding other elements to the learning process like emotional responses. Who knows what the curve may look like in a dynamic rather than controlled environment? Not to mention relatable items rather than syllables. A brief comment at the end of this paper refers to implicit memory, which is essentially when we are learning things unconsciously, something I will share in a future video, but the conclusion ends with an equation to map or graph the forgetting sort of curve. But when considering the bump due to sleep and vast variations that can happen in real life, not in controlled laboratory environments, I'm left with a few questions. If the forgetting curve can be bumped by sleep, what else is it bumped by? We know repetition helps, emotional responses help, mental states, mental techniques, associations, mental rehearsal, and a variety of other factors that occur in everyday life help. So is the forgetting curve something we need to look for to find? And if so, what is the benefit of finding it? If I forget something straight away, then the curve is just a line down. If I remember something and won't forget it, for whatever reason, then it is a line across. Most people use the curve to guide intervals, but if each experience has a different trajectory, line down, line across, a steep or shallow curve, then each interval needs to be tailored to their curve, which is almost impossible to know. Which leads me to the question, what is the curve useful for if it changes so much? What do you think?